Tim. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along, and hopefully you gain a bit more of information and knowledge from today's talk. Um, we will be basing it on optimizing your pre um, nutrition to fuel your performance. Uh, before I get off, what is the main sport or training that people here would do? If anyone wants to share. Triathlon. triathlon. A lot of us, are you in the same club? Yeah. Amateur triathlon. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an amateur triathlon myself. <laughs> okay. Um, so a lot of the endurance-based sports then. Okay, great. Um, well, hopefully then this is very much geared towards endurance-based sports. It's something that I have a big interest in and in terms of how we can fuel that performance in both your training days your, and your race days. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just the next slide. Just a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Orla, forget about the spelling, don't even try to pronounce it that way. Um, as you can tell, I'm from Cork in Ireland, very similar to Pam, know her from home. Ireland's a very small country, so we all know each other. Um, I am an Irish and um, Australian registered dietitian, and I did my undergrad in dietetics back home in Trinity College in Dublin. And then while working full time in the clinical setting in Cork, I um, took a postgraduate in sports nutrition and exercise. So this was done in Leeds Beckett University in Leeds part time. And they are one of the leading universities in the world of sports, sports science. So it was really good to learn from the best in that setting. Um, and from there, when I came over here last year, I started working in a private clinic out in Sydney Olympic Park and that's where I worked a lot with youth athletes but also with New South Wales golf, um, gymnasts, triathletes, um, track athletes, cyclists ranging from your youth athletes to your master athletes so I got a really good experience both in that setting and have been doing freelance from there. I do have a passion for clinical work as well so at the moment I am working full-time as a uh, Neurologist, neurology and oncology dietitian out in Westmead in the Children's Hospital out there. Um, so that's just a basic background about myself. Um, in terms of upskilling and in the world of sports nutrition, I also hold an ISAC Level 1 um, certificate in anthropometry. So this allows me to measure and analyse people's body composition, um, which is important for some more sports in particular, such as MMA, boxing, and things like that. What do I love? Triathlons. Amateur, like Tim, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. Um, really into running, and I suppose my love and my um, desire in wanting to pick a career in sports, sports nutrition and dietetics came from my background in dancing. So I did a lot of dancing growing up, up until the age of around 23, 22. Um, and maybe that's why I've chosen the more endurance-based sports from there. And if I wasn't a dietitian, I feel like maybe just me, I'd love to be a food critic and just get paid to eat. Um, so moving on, um, what will this seminar provide to you? So it's going to be an evidence-based toolkit on building strong foundations for enhancing performance nutrition. We're going to give you the tools to understanding the importance of adequately fueling your energy demands, discovering optimal protein sources and timing of these protein sources for both muscle growth and repair, focusing on the quality and also the quantity of fats to include in your diet, and what I feel might be a very hot topic, especially for triathletes and triathlons, is exploring the various types of carbohydrates for training and race day requirements. We're going to look at effective hydration strategies for both training and race events and in a top tip, optimize performance for race day. So that's just an overall view. So to start off, we must look at the basics. So here on your left hand side of the screen is what your general typical plate day to day should be made up of. This is for your general adult who are doing around 100 to 150 minutes of moderately intense exercise during the week. This is a baseline recommendation and it comes to individuality where we look at different people's energy demands and energy outputs 
where this plate and the proportion of fruit and veg to carbs and protein may change a bit. I wanted to put it up here because it's really, really important before we focus on different types of supplements, before we look at specific nutrition for your sporting needs, without a strong foundation, and that foundation being from your individual and important food groups, you're going to find yourself with an imbalanced pyramid. If we focus here first on, okay, I'm training for this cycling event and I'm going to try this supplement and this is what is going to get me to the fastest time and get me to improve my performance on the day. If you start here, but you haven't thought about the basics and you don't have a strong basics in your carb, your protein, your fat sources, then this won't have as good an effect as this if that makes sense. So from that, we must look at first energy, energy as a whole. Energy is what allows our lungs to keep breathing, our heart to keep beating, our mind to keep ticking. So calories in, we must look at calories out. All food we consume contains calories, but that doesn't mean that all food is the same. So especially when we look at having high training demands and we're training lots and lots, we might find that eating anything is beneficial. But what's important is that some foods, discretionary foods, such as chips, um, it could be the likes of um, on-the-go prepackaged foods, some of them are what we call empty calories because they're providing you with no added nutritional benefit to the diet. So it's really important to think of the quality of the calories we're eating and not to just think about meeting those energy needs. If that, thank you. So when we talk about calories in to calories out, we're looking at energy balance overall. For you guys, when your training demands are that bit much higher and we have that interest in those high endurance sports, our output is higher than your general um, day-to-day -day who um, person who's just going to the gym maybe two to three times a week just for a general um, health and fitness well-being. When we look at adding sport into this, a topic that comes up is what I call energy availability. So energy availability is the energy amount needed for the body to carry out um, all its other bodily functions once, do you mind going back a slide, Al? No, you're fine. Um, once the exercise you have done has been deducted. So what we find, and this goes back to evolution, is that we were born to survive and to hunt. And our body, when we don't fuel it with enough source of energy, but we're putting out a high energy demand, it clicks slightly back into that survival mode. So what it starts to do is it starts to hold on to whatever energy we're giving and it might not be fueling or optimizing that energy as well as it could be if we were to give it the adequate amount of energy it needs to both allow us for our day-to-day -day functions and to allow us to perform in that um, higher standard for both training purposes. To put it into context, if you were to look at your brain um, and just for general day-to-day -day function, as we all are, um, our brain's main source of fuel is carbohydrates and its main use is glucose. If you were to think of the amount of energy your brain uses day-to-day -day, and think of that in, just for example, slices of bread, how many slices of bread do you think your brain uses in energy a day just your brain you're not doing anything you're just just your brain two eight a whole loaf <laughs> how big is your loaf <laughs> yeah so it, it it's actually yeah higher worth pam was saying around eight to ten slices equivalent in energy so if that's just for your brain what about every other factor we put in um, so yeah, it's just something to think about and why is it important? Why is adequate input to output something we need to look at? It supports optimal bodily function. 
It determines your requirements for both macro and micronutrient needs and assists in manipulating body composition where needed. So energy requirements depend on the type of training being carried out. What also depends on it is your gender. It depends on your height, your weight, and your general activity levels. So that's why there is the standard that the Australian Dietary Guidelines would produce um, in terms of how much calories per person we should be aiming for. Roughly for a woman, 60 kgs they have used as a average, they would say around 2,000 calories. That's not looking at anyone who's doing more than two to three training sessions. It's not looking at their age, their weight, their um, stage in if we're looking at their premenstrual, menstrual or postmenstrual cycle. It's just the average. So that's why it's a good baseline, but individualization is the key to be more specific in how much energy you as an individual need. Um, so when we think of energy systems, there's three main energy systems our body uses. So we have anaerobic and we've aerobic. Anaerobic, this is when there's short, intense bursts of activity. So around 10 seconds of effort. And this uses what we call the creatine phosphate energy system. When we have higher intensity efforts, and this is from around the 10 second to two minute spurts of effort, we tap into our carbohydrate energy system. When we're looking at aerobic and we're looking at events that are lasting longer than those two to three minutes, our source of fuel is our carbs and our fat. Thanks, Elle. Um, so when we think about energy systems and when we think about endurance sports and our aerobic fitness, we have to think about what I call VO2 max. And VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that your body is able to use during exercise. So the higher VO2 max you have means the better handle you have over aerobic fitness activities, like swimming, like running, like cycling, overall a triathlon. <laughs> during, if we can see a look at this graph, what this graph shows you is how your body is using glucose, which is what carbohydrate breaks down into as a source of fuel, or fat as a source of fuel. So during lower intensity endurance exercises, where your maximum VO2 max is around less than that 60%, we're using both fat and carbs to help support metabolism and help to provide your energy and muscles with, um, with energy, your cells with energy. Sorry, got my words mixed up. When we get to that higher exercise intensity, so we're really our heart rate is quickening up, we're above that 70% VO2 max, there's a shift towards using more carbs to support that continuous effort and to support that stamina in your exercising. So, if you don't mind, I'll thank you. I want to just, before going into nutrient requirements as a whole, this was designed by um, the FIFA Nutritional Consensus Board. Um, and what it is, is it gives an average what they would recommend as an easy training day plate, a moderate training day, and a higher training day. As you can see, your easy training day quite looks quite similar to that first plate I was looking, I was showing you, where half your plate is made up of your fruit and vegetable sources. A quarter to a third is made up of that protein source, and that's where your carbohydrates takes around a quarter to um, a third as well. When we're doing a little bit more moderate training, so we're training up to those four to five times, we're having a lot of effort intense training sessions. This is where the proportion of the different macronutrients changes on the plate. So we can see, and this ties into what I was just previously saying about carbohydrates being used as that main fuel source for those higher intensity exercises. We can see the shift of carbs is slightly coming into that fruit and veggies. When we go to that hard training day, that race day, that pre-night pizza, that pre-night pasta that you all go for before an event, this is where the carbohydrates are taking up half of that plate. This is more just a general overview of how your macronutrients may shift to what you need. And again, it's based on general recommendations. This 
can be individualized and, and teased to people's preferences. But overall, it's to just show that you have your standard for your easy moderate and the changes that your macronutrients must make to meet your energy and training demands. So that brings me on to looking at nutrient requirements for sport as a whole. So let's start with what is a very popular um, macronutrient in the sporting world and one that I think gets a lot more media than others potentially is protein. Now protein is great, protein is needed. Um, it helps with tissue repair and growth. It helps in enzyme and hormone production. For example, protein is one of the backbones to making your red blood cells. So without protein, your red blood cells, which helps carry oxygen around the, the, the body, it wouldn't function as well. It helps with fluid and electrolyte balance, transport, and it is an energy source in itself. What is protein? Protein is made up of smaller, if you don't mind going back, i sorry. No, you're fine. Um, just back again and again. Yeah, perfect. Um, so it's made up of smaller substances, which are known as amino acids. So there is in total 20 amino acids that branch together to form a peptide and little peptides branch together to form protein. Our body can make 11 of those amino, amino acids itself. It can reproduce it itself, happy days, it's on the way. However, there's nine of them, which they can only derive from dietary sources. So that's what we call essential amino acids. The Australian dietary guidelines on average say that it should make up around 15 to 25% of your total energy needs. Two and a half serves for women, three serves for men. If we were to look at types of protein, and I touched on it briefly about the quality, if you don't mind, thanks. Um, we must look at the quality of, a, of protein, and this is determined by the amount of essential amino acids that that protein contains. So we have complete and non-complete proteins. Complete proteins are ones that contain all your nine essential amino acids, and these come from mainly high quality animal based sources. So this could be your red meats, your poultry, your eggs, your dairy, your fish, and so forth. For those at risk of potentially lacking some amino acids or having to pay closer attention, we look at non-complete sources as some of them may lack at least one essential amino acid. And so these are a lower quality source of protein and are mainly derived from plant foods such as legumes, vegetables, cereals, grains, and, and um, other um, carbohydrate products. However, there is a way to combat this, um, especially for those following vegan or vegetarian diets. It's looking at higher quality sources, such as soy-based, tempeh, tofu, things like that. It's also looking at pairing different plant-based sources together to make a complete protein. So for example, a lot you may think of rice and when you think of rice you would think of beans to put together and that's not just out of nowhere someone's come up with that um, so what rice has it's low in lysine which is one of your amino acids essential amino acids and high in methionine what beans don't have it's low in methionine and high in lysine put them together you're making a complete protein so there is ways to work around it, but it's just being aware of the different quality of protein sources out there. So if we were to look at in sports, protein recommendations for non-elite and elite athletes um, vary majorly depending on their sport. Um, they consume, why do we consume protein? It's predominantly to help repair and rebuild skeletal muscle and connective tissue following intense training or race events. So for the average Australian woman or um, male, it's recommended about 0 0.75 grams per kg body weight a day of protein. For males, it's around 0 0.84 grams per kg body weight a day of protein. Uh, offhand, has, what have people been ever advised or have heard that they should be having in terms of the amount of protein per day? A lot less? Yeah, a lot more. A lot more? How much more? Like, almost two grams per kilogram for like heavy weight training. 
heavyweight training. Okay. Anything else? One point five. Yeah. So um, again. Yeah. So this is for your average, your um, your average Australian who's doing just general, moderate, intense two to three training sessions. When we look at higher intensity training, like your non-elite and elite athletes, this changes because we're breaking and rebuilding muscle a little more than your average Australian day to day. But again, it's not as high, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised that people haven't, because I've heard much, much higher in the past. Um, so if we were to look at, for endurance sports, it's usually around 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kg body weight a day, which will allow you to maintain your current weight and also help you rebuild um, the muscle after training. When we're looking at if you're in a calorie deficit, for example, but you want to maintain that muscle mass, this can change and we actually are focusing a little bit higher in the protein amount, around 1.6 to 2.4 grams per kg body weight a day. However, when I say this, the highest recommended protein intake around that 2 to 2.4 grams per kg body weight a day, that's for bodybuilders. That's for those Olympic weightlifters. So for people who are doing more endurance-based sports where they don't need to be lifting as heavy weights as that or building as heavy muscle as that, we're looking at the lower end. We're looking at that 1.6, 1.2 grams. And again, this is all down to individual variety because you have to look at what you're currently having and what you think is realistic for you on a day-to-day -day basis also. And what about someone who's doing a combination of endurance and strength? Yeah, so that would, it would still be at the lower because that's taking into consideration like athletes who are doing endurance-based sports, they're still having those strength training sessions in between. Yeah. Um, it would be more those who are doing less cardio-based, more power, more strength, it'd be at the higher end. If you think of it from a gravity side of things as well, when we build more muscle, we put on more weight. So if we're looking at trying to be faster in a race perspective as well, you wouldn't see Usain Bolt. <laughs> but Usain Bolt would have very different protein intakes compared to the likes of a bodybuilder and things like that. Yeah, but it's definitely something important and needs to be um, included in the diet, especially for repair. And when you have those high training loads and constant training, if we're constantly breaking down our, our muscles, but not giving it that adequate protein source, then that's putting at higher, us at higher risk of stress fractures, of um, strains, pulls, and things like that. Um, if I was to say a little bit more on it, when we're looking at those higher end recommendations that I see a lot of online Instagram influencers potentially advising, you have to look at the safer upper limit um, because I've been like for example someone was once advised around four to five grams per kg body weight a day of protein but you have to look at your overall physiological health as well and looking at those high amounts of protein all get excreted and broken down through your kidneys and through your renal system so that's putting a lot of pressure on your kidneys and renal function with that high amount of protein. And what is the effect that's doing or what is the benefit even of those high amounts? Which brings me along, sorry Elle, thank you, to protein timing. Because protein timing, we have heard of that anabolic window. So that 30 to 90 minutes post-exercise, I have to have my protein shake, I have to get my protein in or there's no point. I just give up now. That's not true. You have, you have between 24 to 48 hours, your muscle is breaking down. So that it's okay. We don't need to cry if we don't get our eggs and our toast in straight away. Um, one, should you focus on protein? So pre or during exercise, um, you should really be focusing on topping up on your carb stores, which I'll be going into a little bit more in detail in a minute. And this is through carb-rich sources. During exercise, the amount of protein we use is very negligible. 
um, because we're really tapping into those fat and carbohydrate energy sources. It's in that post-anabolic window, within that first 24 to 48 hours, that it's the highest efficient protein turnover. So it's that time when we've broken down and our body is wanting that extra protein, that's when we should be having it. What's better, consuming a high protein meal once or consuming it throughout the day? In general here, do people consume protein consistently throughout the day? Would you have it in one go? Three times consistent? Great. Yeah, so overall, as I said, it keeps turning over for 24, 48 hours. Why it's recommended more to do it evenly throughout the day is because there's a certain amount of protein that we can actually absorb in one sitting that can actually be effectively used in one sitting. And that's around the 20 to 40 grams a mark. So if you ever see the likes of um, nine egg omelette, you have to consume this nine egg omelette after your post-workout. About four to five of those eggs are just being peed out. So you can have it if you want. If you want a tasty nine egg omelette, work away. If you're doing it just to get that protein source in, you're better off aiming for two to three eggs and having those other eggs or other protein sources at different times throughout the day. So that's why we think of looking at it around three to five sittings. So like you say, your three main meals, your snacks, trying to aim for around those 15 to 30 grams um, of protein. Eggs are a great source of those healthy fats as well that you can use. So if you want to use it more from just bumping up calories in a meal, feel free. And um, what I would say, um, with eggs is just you have to be considerate of the cholesterol level in eggs. So I wouldn't, um, fine if you have un no underlying heart conditions to have around three eggs, um, three to four eggs a day. If you are anyone who might, you know, have high cholesterol or have history of underlying heart condition, I would just limit it to that two, um, two eggs a day um, in terms of cholesterol level. But from a calorie perspective, eggs are a great source of calories. So it can definitely be used to bump up meals. Um, but if we were looking just at, I'm using this to meet my protein, then I'd stick to maybe the two to three. Um, so that brings us on to fat. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> so what, why is dietary fat important? Um, so it helps with cell and hormone production. It also helps in the absorption of fat soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K. It helps in the insulation of our vital organs. And it's also a source of energy in itself. So it's a really good source of energy. It has around nine cal kilocals per gram of fat. However, we need to try limit the amount of fats or spreads or oils eaten as both healthy or unhealthy are still high in calories. So we need to look at both quality and quantity of fats that we use in the diet. It should still meet around 25 to 35 percent of your overall um, energy needs and with less than 10% coming from what we call saturated fats, which I'll touch on in a minute. A lot of people who follow me um, lower fats diets um, in terms of trying to maintain weight or lose weight, it's still really important that we, con that we consume a certain amount of fat in our diet, um, even from a heart health perspective. Um, and also we find particularly for the likes, if we look back at, I was speaking about that energy availability and being at risk of going back into survival mode, you might often find those who are not meeting their overall energy needs and who are not meeting a good amount of fat in their diet, uh, putting them at higher risk of going back into that, I must go back into my survival mode and not using their bodily functions as adequately as they can be. So when we look at types of fat, there's a variety of types. I just touched on what we call saturated fats. So saturated fats come from the likes of um, butter, comes from the likes of coconut oil, coconut milk. Um, it also comes from those like deep fat frying oils. And what saturated fats do is they can raise the blood cholesterol and you must try and limit this intake. So if you look at your bloodstream like a motorway, and if you look at saturated fats being mud emptied onto that motorway. So what they're doing is they're slowing that traffic down and they're making it really hard 
for anything to pass through. So essentially, they're blocking that blood flowing as adequately as it can be. When we look at polyunsaturated fats, what polyunsaturated fats do, it's like the hero. So they help lower your blood cholesterol and they're the best source of fats for your heart health. So what polyunsaturated fats could be like looked at, like that truck. So they're taking up that mud, they're clearing that motorway so that your blood can flow adequately and keep pumping to your cells, to your heart, to your lungs and so forth. Sources of polyunsaturated fats. Does anyone have any ideas where that could come from? Yeah, amazing. Great one. Nuts, yeah. Olive oil, yeah. Um, oily fish is a great one as well. Um, seeds, things like that. Um, rapeseed oil, canola oil, those things. They're all really good sources of um, polyunsaturated fats. When we look at trans fats, um, if we are to look trans fats, they are kind of your fast food takeaways. So they would use a high amount of trans fats. So McDonald's, um, KFCs, any of those fast food chains. And what they do is your cholesterol is made up of low density lipoproteins called LDLs. So they're your bad fat. And it's also made up of high density lipoproteins called HDLs, your good fats. What trans fats do is they cause an imbalance. So they increase the amount of LDLs and decrease the amount of HDLs. So limiting the amount of trans fat in your diet when possible is really important. So, okay, we've talked about fats, we've looked at in general, what about for the athlete themselves? So Thomas A. et al. is one of the world renowned researchers in sports, sports nutrition and medicine, and they did a huge meta-analysis about how much fat should the non-elite elite athletes have. And what it came down to in the consensus is that intake of fat by athletes should be in accordance with public health guidelines and they should be individualized based on training level and body composition goals. So in a whole, it comes down to back to basics, looking at your energy in and your energy out. And it's also just looking at the types of fat that we want to include. This brings us on to the main event, carbohydrates. <laughs> What, before I go into it, what are people's feelings on carbohydrates? What do they think its role, particularly in sports, would be? In energy? Fuel. 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 Stamina. Stamina. Recovery. Recovery. Yeah, all great points. Um, so carbohydrates is the main energy source that is used by your brain to function. And it's also the main energy source used for physical activity, including everyday activities, but also leisure. So you might hear of people who go on the keto diet. And this is a very low carb, um, high fat diet. I actually use the ketogenic diet at the moment in hospital with patients who um, suffer with epilepsy. So it's a clinically medicalized diet, which is shown to have effect in helping to reduce the amount of seizures with patients with epilepsy. So that is where it's used in a clinical and controlled setting. Where it's to be used in terms of sports and for the general day-to-day -day human, um, we're using carbs as our main fuel source to the brain. We're using carbs as our main fuel source for our sporting needs. So what happens if we're changing to a low-carb diet? If we look at our bodies like a car and we look at carbohydrates as the petrol, what happens if we're not putting the petrol in the car? Yep, straight on the money. Um, so how much carbs do I need? The amount of carbs in a well-balanced meal depends on your level of physical activity. This includes both scheduled and unscheduled exercise. Um, and this can vary week to week, day to day, um, even hour to hour. But overall, it's broken into low activity day, medium activity day, high activity day. So you have those lower intense exercises or those incidental activities. So gardening, walking, washing, cleaning. You might have those medium activity days. So it's a little bit higher intensity. Um, it could be more of you know, swimming, 
jogging, cycling, but not at your maximum effort. And then you have those higher intensity days where you could have those longer training sessions or smaller bouts of training throughout the day or boxing, which is a repetitive exercises or even your race day events. So if we are to look at carbohydrates, so the amount of carbs, carbs are stored in our liver and it's also stored in our muscles in the form of what we call glycogen. But with carbohydrates compared to fat, we have enough fat in our body that could give us enough energy for maybe three to four days. Whereas carbs stores are the limiting factor. So for performance and it can't store as much carbs in the body for as long. So we continuously need to top up our carb stores because it's used more often than it is fat, specific, um, specifically when looking at exercise as well. So if we were to just look at what are carbs, what happens when we eat a slice of bread or pasta? It's broken down into a simple sugar called glucose. And glucose is quickly transported as an energy source to the muscles during exercise. So your muscles contain energy cells and the glucose goes into these energy cells and they help um, by topping up the energy source. And what does this do? It helps reduce the onset of fatigue. It also increases your performance and helps you maintain that same intensity. So the more we top it up, the more um, frequently we're able to provide that carb source when needed, the better we may feel in the long run in terms of fatigue, performance, stamina, all those things that you've mentioned. So carbs promote um, advantages over fat, as I've already mentioned, in terms of the fuel, um, as it promotes a higher exercise intensity. So when we're going into that higher intense exercise, when we're using that higher amount of oxygen, when we need to pump more blood to our cells to keep working, carbs is that main fuel source. It helps with prolonging um, sustained or intermittent high intense exercises. Um, and what low carb stores may be associated with, if we are to look at, um, you might find sometimes marathon runners or in that triathlon hitting that wall. What does that wall feel like? <laughs> <laughs> not good, not good. Now, some of it could be mental. Some of it is a mental battle, but having good carb stores will help reduce fatigue, will help reduce that perception of effort. Um, and it'll also, if you find you're not having enough carbs, that might impair your skill and concentration level. What I have here, and again, I always go back to, it's all about individuals. It's all about what you're having now and what you think is realistic in your day-to-day -day life. This just goes through the amount of carbohydrates you should be having based on your training activities. So this is focused specifically, if we're looking at the average human around 50% of carbs should make up their diet. This is looking at the likes who are doing that higher level of training, those non-elite elite athletes. So we have your light, your lower intensity days, your more skill-based activities. We're wanting to try and aim for around those three to five grams per kg body weight a day of carbs. When we're looking at moderate exercise program, about one hour a day of high intensity, we're looking at five to seven grams of kg body weight a day. When we're looking at race day, we're looking at the days leading up, we're having events um, that are going to be lasting for those four to five hours plus. We're wanting to aim for those six to seven grams per kg body weight a day. But I suppose that comes down to individualization as well. Because yeah. we come in a westernized diet, we also come with the background of following more lower carbs this is high for a lot of people some people might be able to use this and that comes down to individualization looking at where you're at now yeah. and where can you aim to or how much do you think you would be able to achieve in the types of um the amount of carbs we can have in one sitting um it's looking at ways we can enhance the absorption of that during, if you're even focusing on during training sessions itself, which I'll focus on in a sec, okay. but you can consume more carbs because you're using it more often. So yeah. you're constantly needing to top that up. So having those 300 grams isn't, uh, isn't insane, no. 
it's yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And I suppose it comes down to his individual needs yeah. and what he's used to trying before races, what he's comfortable and he knows his tummy can mm. handle oh, as well. Yeah, no, you're fine. You're fine. These are, this is, yeah. Yeah, but it's all looking about, again, if we look at the sources as well, because it's looking at different types of carbohydrate sources can give you the same amount of carbs, but in smaller or larger quantities. So if we looked at just L this page, so this is looking at your standard, what people see, your complex carbohydrates. And this is something that I really hone in on and would advise for your average meals, your main meals to include these sources. Um, even from a whole grain perspective, looking at fiber, fiber helps sustain energy, but also helps in heart health and also um, gut health in terms of your microbiome and things like that. So we're looking at legumes, we're looking at starchy veg, your grains, your pasta, your noodles, things like that. If we go on, oh, sorry, um, to looking at the type of carb and when to eat it, this is where it goes a little bit different. So if we look at two to three hours before training, so this is for a training day setting, we're wanting to get, um, on average, people find around 30 to 60 grams of carbs in that meal optimal or easy to obtain. Um, this is looking more at your complex carbs. You want just a balanced meal, essentially, if it's two to three hours before training. You want your recommended fruit and veg, your small amount of healthy fats, your lean protein source, and that higher fiber, a higher fiber carbohydrate. So it could be your porridge in the morning with your bananas, your milk as your protein source, your sandwich, things like that. When we look at closer, when you don't have a lot of time on your hands, and you're looking at those 30 to 60 minutes before, you're trying to get that extra quick boost of energy, we look at what we call high GI carbohydrate sources. So glycemic index, does anyone know what glycemic index is? So you see how quickly it spikes your blood sugars. Yeah, yeah, very good. So um, when we look at balanced meals, we want to go for those more, more lower GI carbohydrate sources, so those starchy veg, the whole grain, the um, potato, things like that. When we're looking at that, we want that quick boost of energy. So if you think of kids at a party and they go to the sweets table and then they're whizzing around for about 30, 40 minutes and then they crash, that is high GI carbohydrates. So that is where it's shooting up those blood sugars. It's giving glucose to the cells quickly. And that's what we want to try achieve. What it also is, we want to try to get something that's lower fiber because you might find like that if you were to look at a plate of the amount of carbs you need in slices of bread, you get a bit overwhelmed. It'd be a lot to try to consume. Whereas if we're looking at a lower fiber, lower fat source, um, that will help even minimize any gastrointestinal issues you might find. Because some people might find those higher fibers close to exercise or training makes us feel heavy, makes us feel tired. Um, whereas we want that quick boost of energy. So the likes of banana, Gatorade, even simple jam and toast, red lollies are always a favorite, things like that um, are different and what I would go to closer training session. So this brings us to during, and this is a graph that I think will help, I think meet that when you're on about the absorption on how much we can absorb. Um, so during training, our body is utilizing carbohydrate stores to provide muscles um, with energy. If we were exercising for less than 60 minutes, we don't, if we've topped up adequately enough with enough carbohydrates going into the session, just from our general meals, pre-training carbohydrate top up, generally we don't need to be get, give, taking anything more. We don't need to be, you know, if you like, some people like and have slight um, placebo effect in rinsing with like a carbohydrate energy drink in the mouth. Others might just find drinking water does them, but from a utilization, there's no added benefit to having anything if you're training for less than 60 minutes. If we are getting more into that one, one and a half hours, what is advised is around trying to obtain 30 grams of carbs an hour. 
So this would be, um, you know, you wouldn't wait till the hour and then say, okay, I'm going to start taking it now. If you're going into a session knowing, okay, I'm going to be training for one and a half, two hours here, I need to be aiming to get around 30 grams of carbs in. Maybe after the first 30, 35 minutes, you start thinking about taking those carbs on. When we're training for around two to three hours, we're looking at trying to aim for that higher amount of carbs. So we're looking at those 60 grams an hour. Um, and then when we look at the endurance events, we look at those race days. When we're training greater than two and a half hours, we're wanting to aim for over that 90 grams an hour. Now this again comes down to individual preference. Some people who may never have taken carbs on before during training or during an event may find it very hard or difficult to then try and aim for 60 to 90 grams an hour of carbohydrates. Mm. at a high intensity are you going to need more than that 30 grams per hour um so if it's at a higher intensity you could try and range up to the 30 to 60 grams an hour but it's mainly just utilized from that when we look at um going longer for greater than those three hours so the main fuel source is glucose that's where most of your energy gels are made from but glucose when it gets to around that 90 grams after an hour it slows down in its effectiveness of absorption so that's where the likes of taking on different carbohydrate sources like fructose you might see a lot of those glucose fructose gels fructose helps with glucose being absorbed in a different pathway and being absorbed more efficiently you only really need to think about that when we're looking at this kind of level Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, they have the good mix. Yeah. Would you find people get more? I know gauze irritation is a big yeah. thing that comes into play with like gels. Do you mm. find people have a better response to like glucose versus fructose, or is it all? It's all really individualized. So it really depends on, and that's a, a big thing is um, your gut issues. Yeah and being able to what you can absorb or not absorb but how you can handle it um in that sense um i just which we quite down a bit um from there if we were to look at um what was my train of thought we were on about glucose um intolerance yeah gut intolerance um when we look at day to day some people find that they just can't handle the gels at all um, and that is completely normal, but w you have to look at how much are you able to tolerate right now? Because some people, their max might be 60, and that could be the, for the full, the full Ironman across it, because they just can't tolerate that more. And that could be a mix of gels, it could be a mix of drinks, it could be lollies, bananas, even sandwiches. It's really dependent on what people day to day, and that's why trial and testing in training sessions is really important. I would never go into a race without with something you've never tried. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, um, yeah, yeah. Especially on the bike, and that's and that also helps in terms of hydration and getting that back in in that sense. Um, yeah. So going. Um, does anyone have any other questions before I move on? Do they do different? Sizes jet, like gel sachets. Yeah. Yeah. So like, like um. Like, say one that's thirty grams. Yeah. So Martin are actually probably one of the smallest. Okay. Um, um, but they do have different size ones. Most of them, they would be maybe around like the thirty to forty gram mark. But um, yeah. Again, that comes down to trial and error. Yeah. Some people like the thicker gel and just mm. get it down and hatch. Some people like one that's a little bit more. Yeah liquid based and um, so it's easier and um, so going on to post training needs so early consumption of carbs after training helps replenish your energy stores effectively so we've talked up before we've talked up during now we're looking at after so carbs are still and will become your best friend 
For a meal or snack, a moderate source of carbs helps replenish your stores and you want to choose carbs that are higher in fiber. So you want to choose something that's more of that meal-based complex carbohydrate source. We want to ensure that we're still including um, a high quality source of protein because like I say, after training, after those race events, your muscles have been used. So your breakdown and trying to repair those muscles is really important to help reduce injury and also rehydrate. So replacing fluid levels is key to reducing risk of dehydration um, and revitalize. So we want, yeah. Yeah, of course. No, alcohol. no stupid questions. Alcohol, please. Yes. How does that? I'll be jumping onto hydration in a minute there. Um, but um, I know we all love a little cheers and a little celebratory drink, which is fine, all in moderation. Um, what alcohol does is it dehydration. So that brings us on if we look at hydration and ensuring that we're rehydration adequately. Um, alcohol, when we consume it, sends off a little alarm or a little bell in our head to tell our um, kidneys to hold on, hold on to the water, hold on to everything. And what it does is, or not, it doesn't say to hold on, it says to loose go. Sorry, I'm getting all confused. So you actually might find that once you start going to the toilet after alcohol, it comes more often and often. And what it does is it doesn't replenish your um, fluid levels as adequately as any other fluid source. So it actually can cause you to become more dehydrated um, when you're consuming alcohol, especially after a race where you're already potentially yeah, I, I, dehydrated. I, 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 if we were to move on to looking at just some sample ideas for post-training, we have your on the go your Yopro, your banana, we have your up and go protein milks, if you short for time. We then have just your standard balanced meal. So we have the likes of, you know, a stir fry, chicken sandwich, omelet with toast, um, protein or just standard pancakes if we're feeling like a little treat, um, or poke bowls where we're looking at a healthy source of um, oily fish. We have your whole grain rice, your veggies, your avocado, things like that. So these are just few of many choices that you can post. go for for post yeah these could also be used as a main meal in itself for those two to three hours beforehand and what essentially it's just looking at is getting that complex carb those healthy fats that source of protein and um, if we were to look at hydration coming back to your favorite topic <laughs> um, so our body is made up of 60 percent of body of water um, and on average, it's recommended around 35 mils per kg body weight of day is the amount of fluid we should be consuming. What does being hydrated do? What does having adequate water importance be? So it helps with blood volume and pressure regulation. It helps with the transfer of heat for oxygen and nutrient transportation, for absorption of nutrients, excretion of waste and also for cushioning and protection. So quite similar to energy in to energy out, we wanna try stay in what we call a U-hydrated state. So we wanna stay in a balanced state of hydration where the fluid we gain from the fluid we consume, the food we consume, our metabolic water itself, balances to what we're losing. So balances what we lose through air, sweat, skin loss, urine. And this is what the goal would be to stay. If we were to move on, L, thank you. 2% dehydration can negatively impact your exercise performance. 2% can make that change or that difference. If we were to look at this lovely picture to the left, these are varying colors of your urine. What color do we think is a good example of being in a hydrated state. This is just, um, I suppose, a fast way to check if you're hydrated. There's other ways to check, and this is if you find it's, you're finding it hard to check due to some medication or supplements you may take, there is other ways to go about it. Um, in that sense, it's looking at your thirst perceptions, it's looking at, um, are we having, you know, brain fog, are we feeling a bit dizzy, lightheaded, other things like that. Um, Sometimes to touch as well, if our skin feels really, really tight, that can cause us to um, 
show signs of dehydration. Um, that would be a very severe sign though, so I would, I would um, call a GP at that. Um, if we were to look at rehydrating drinks, um, focusing on those more post-training um, needs, we look at consuming three components. So we're looking at water for the fluid intake, we're looking at your carbohydrate source to help with fluid absorption, and we're also looking at sodium, so for fluid distribution and also for fluid retention. So sodium, would a lot of people take salt tabs here? Yeah. yeah. When would you take them? In the water. In the water, Before during, the on the bike? Before and during. Before and, and during? Every day. Every, a, lot days, yeah. a lot of days, okay. Never? Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I didn't. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and it depends on. It's not like just um, So it can be some. Pure sodium. Yeah, so there's um, electrolytes which you can include after for post hydration because we are losing um, electrolytes through sweat and through losses. Some people find um, that they, in terms of keeping in a hydrated state during events or training, taking sodium helps with retaining that water. Um, it's not something that is needed for everyone um but there is a certain amount of sodium in electrolytes post training mm. as well um sorry were you, sorry were you saying that salt helps you in retaining the yeah so salt so, so sodium essentially salt is made up of sodium and chloride so um salt tabs is just the name given to them um but it helps with water retention so um if we are especially for high sweaters or high sweat losses, you might find sometimes after training, if you looked at your clothes, you could see some people have those white streaks. So that's actually just your salt, your salt coming off. Um, whereas taking salt pre or during, especially on the bike, those longer training sessions helps with trying to retain water. Um, but not everyone has to take them. It really depends on your, um, if you're a high sweater, if you're a low sweater, or what you think works. Your temperature, the humidity, your environment, things like that. Um, when we look at if you're having adequate hydration, so if we're looking at you have around those 8 to 12 hours to hydrate at um, a normal level, then we don't need to, um, and there hasn't been great fluid losses, so you haven't had a really heavy session, you felt you haven't lost a lot of sweat, then there's no real specific pre or post post um, hydration strategies that you need to obtain by. Um, if you find that you're a heavy sweater or you find that you get dehydrated quite easily, there is certain things that you could follow pre-race, um, such as aiming for around four hours beforehand. You want to get around five to seven milliliters per kg body weight a day of water. What I would say is, let's say, so if you're a 100 kg man, it's about 500 mils. That's about half a liter, something like that. If two, two hours before you go to the bathroom, you check, your pee isn't still in that one to three mark, I'd be taking on maybe an extra two to 300 mils of fluid. Um, what we find is drinking too much too quickly, close to race, can make us just feel really, really heavy. So it's important to get hydrated coming up to the race, but it's to start early, essentially. Some people find like that taking sodium beforehand as well helps. Um, some people find that they'd rather wait to take it during. This can be taken in the likes of sodium tabs just in water. It can be taken, um, some of the drink powders itself would contain an amount of sodium. Some of the electrolyte powders would contain sodium in that way. After, um, what in terms of knowing how much fluid you need to regain into the body, looks at again sweat so for every one and a half one liters of fluid lost you should be trying to drink around one and a half liters of water not straight away but over the coming hours so a good way to know how much you should have day to day is before you do a training session your average training session hop on the scales try hop on it soon after see how much you've lost and that would give you a rough estimate of how much fluid you should be having for those um, few hours after a heavy training session. Um, if we want to look at, sometimes we might overhydrate, so it's really important not to consume too much water. 
there is cases where people have consumed so much water that they've actually drowned their internal organs. And that's when they're having like eight, 10 liters of water in a day. You think, you think it's not possible, but people have. Um, but so there is a fine line. I wouldn't, it's not common, so don't worry for anyone panicking. Um, but it is looking at keeping in a eu-hydrated state. We're keeping hydrated, but we're not over-hydrating. Because what you might find as well is like that with salts and our electrolytes. If we drink a lot of water, this lowers the amount of sodium or blood sodium in our body. And this can negatively also affect our race day or our, our performance overall, because it can make us feel a bit dizzy, can make our heart race a bit faster and things like that. So hydration is important, but knowing the right amount and when to hydrate adequately is also important. So this brings us just to top tips, summarizing it all together. So carbohydrates, pre, we wanna choose a low fat, low fiber carb before training or a race. Fat and fiber can slow down the digestion and can also lead to upset stomachs during training. When we're looking, and I think you mentioned this previously, that's when we're looking at, you know, that meal before training, we're looking at to aim for around, or meal before your race, apologies, that race day morning, two to three hours out, we're looking at aiming for around one to four grams per kg body weight of carbs in that meal. Some people can aim, get the one, some people can get the four. Again, it comes down to what your body and what your tummy is used to. Just beforehand, like I said, we're 30, 60 minutes out, we've had our pre-carb meal, we want a little bit of a top up, that's when those lower fat, lower fiber carbs come into play again. During, here we can see the greater to one to two hours, we're aiming for that 30, 60 grams of carb, like glucose, when we're doing that greater than two hours, 60, 90 grams plus, we're looking at those multi-carb sources, ones that contain glucose and fructose. Post, a rich meal, both in protein and carb sources. We want to stay hydrated. We want to, to aim to stay in a eu-hydrated state leading up to your race. For every one liter of fluid lost, trying to get that 1.5 for those who are losing um, fluid via the scales. We can try and have those electrolyte tabs that you were saying. So looking at minimum having between 20 to 100 millimoles of sodium in the tab is what the recommended would be. Um, so this can be used for post high sweat, um, lengthy sessions to retain fluid and replace losses. Um, you might find if it's just a skill based session, you haven't feel like you sweated that much, that fluid itself is enough um, without having to use electrolytes. And then rest is key. So adequate sleep, around seven to nine hours. Um, rest in sleep is something I hone into. You might be meeting your nutrition, you might be getting everything right, but if we're not sleeping, if we're not resting, if we're not taking training days um, off, that's gonna impact on our performance as well. So if we go to looking, and I've, I've honed down on this, and this just goes through examples about individualization. So this just looks at a study. I pick something that focuses in this world, high carb or looking at low carb versus a low fat diet. And this was tested um, to see which had the best weight changes over, to six, um, over a 12 month period. And what it showed is that those who followed a low fat diet or those who followed a low carb diet had very similar weight changes. And protein can stay constant throughout. If we were to again look at individualization and we were to look at intermittent fasting, which was a study, if you don't mind the next one, um, which compared those who were eating three main meals throughout the day and a few snacks, and those who ate just between the hours of 12 to eight and looking at changes of weight. Again, very similar results. So a lot of people might have heard of intermittent fasting and um, potential benefits overall, especially for women in terms of hormonal regulation, it's not advised that we take long fasting periods. So we wouldn't be advising to be fasting for greater than 12 to 14 hours 
especially for women. So if you look at it back to basics, so even for without including exercise or training, your energy is used for your general bodily functions. Um, so if we're not eating for a day, then we're essentially putting ourselves into survival mode and using up um, excess stores. So when, if you look at um, not giving yourself food, what we break down first is our carbohydrate stores. What we then break down next is we'll f go into our fat stores. What we do then is we look at our protein stores and where is our protein stored in our muscles? What are we breaking down? Muscle. So fasting is just something that I wouldn't advise for anyone. Essentially, it's starving. It's just starving yourself. And what you find is, which is a lot of people would talk about detox diets, um, you know, those detox fruit juices. The only thing that essentially can detox your body is your liver. Um, so going on those detox fruit juices where you're on limited amount of carbohydrates, um, or not carbohydrates, calories, um, is putting just your general day-to-day -day function like your brain and function like that at risk. Some people are able to do it, but it's more than they're putting their um, body into what we call a fight or flight mode. So they're, if we were to study essentially their cortisol level, which is your stress hormone, I would be very surprised if hers wasn't increased a lot on those days where she's not fueling her body source. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't be something that I would be advising. Um, just for that sense and also food is there to enjoy it and even from a social aspect I personally wouldn't be able to go a day without food um, but um, again it's the, um, it's out there and there's um, the people are going through and having these um, claims but there's not trials or evidence-based clinical studies who involve mm, like hundreds of thousands of people to say it's effective. It could be effective for that one person, but looking at the general population, um, it's just not advised. Like I have, if you were to look at even those low car calorie diets, those 1200 kilocals they advise. Right now in the hospital, I work with children at the age of seven or eight, that is the amount of energy that I would be advising for a seven or eight year old to be having. And that's them just lying down where they're not doing much physical activity so it's really just putting into perspective it's a lot of misinformation is out there on the internet and it's extremely hard like even me going into my course my perception or what i thought i knew about nutrition like within a day or two i was put back into place but it's how are we to know if it's so wild widely and easily accessible and there's no safeguarding it my role and my um, job is safeguarded, thankfully, as a dietitian. I have friends who did the exact same nutritional science degree background. They did four to five years in university. They could stand next to someone who did a six hour nutrition course. And both of them are nutritionists. And both of them can give and supply the same service to people. But it's it's hard and it's hard to know where to go but that's why asking these questions and like figuring these things out is why it's good to have someone to go to um but yeah if we were to look at going on to that all these questions are tying into my slides perfectly um so not one diet or eating pattern fits all so that even ties back to what i've just advised you this is the general recommendations but it really comes down to you as a person what works as you generally or if you have any other medical or other issues that might need to be factored into place as well. So if we were to, could you just go back a slide? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so if you're give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. So how can you do that? By coming to see me. <laughs> so um, after this talk, this gives you just a general recommendation which you can use in your day-to-day -day training. But if you were to look at more, okay, but individually, am I meeting the best I can to fuel my performance? Um, I'll be starting clinic here on Saturday. So I'm opening this Saturday, um, just 8 to a.m. to 1 p.m., um, which you can book via online or my email is both on um, the website or also my phone number is there. 
the initial consult for everyone for coming today and thank you so much for coming and um, we're giving a 50 percent discount so instead of paying 186 um, there will be 50% um, discounted price off that. This we run through um, your current diet, your current training, what your goals would be. Um, and from this we work through a collaborative approach to um, find a nutritional plan that suits you for both day-to-day -day training, race days um, and things like that. So. That's everything in a nutshell. Um, a lot of information overload, but I really appreciate you all coming and I hope you gained something from tonight. Um, so yeah, any questions or anything, I'm here for another 10 to 20 minutes. So thank you.